Hello, welcome back. Here's some more video lectures coming at you. This is a new module, uh, the first video, part one video of our new module, um, Extended Argumentative Analysis. This is the last module before the first exam. Um, so this is going to be kind of a module where we put everything together. We're going to be drawing on things that we were working on with um, language and also uh, with the building blocks of arguments, the annotation project we did um, in the last module. There's also a special writing assignment that's going to be coming on your radar now, um, or that should be getting on your radar now, that is really an attempt to give you the opportunity to get some really robust practice for the first exam about putting all these things together. So I just wanted to say a couple things about that right now. This is a reminder, kind of the instructions of what's going on. Um, the first thing is that uh, the assignment, hey buddy, has um, many parts to it. The first thing is going to be that you need to compose a 500 word um, argumentative essay. It can be on any subject that you want. I don't care. Uh, the only thing I actually really care about is that you write on a subject you actually do care about. So don't pick something that's goofy or you pulled from some other class just to cut down on work or something like that. Pick, pick some topic that you actually have some sincere investment in that you would want to argue about, that you have a position you would want to defend. Um, and then compose the 500 word essay um, as naturally as possible, uh, not trying to be overly academic about it. You don't need to bring any sources or anything like that. Uh, it just needs to be um, at least 500 words and contain arguments. That's the most important thing. Writing the essay is mostly to give you some argumentative content to then go and do these analytic steps on. Um, but at the same time, I, I think you'll get more out of the assignment if you actually care about what you're arguing um, and you're able to kind of get into your natural mode of um, how you argue in a kind of everyday sort of sense. I, I want you to write, the, the more informal your style is, the more casual it is, or the more of just like how you ordinarily think and speak, uh, I think the more useful this, this assignment will be. Every time I have students do this, I, I always have some who come back to me and are like, oh, I didn't, you know, you kind of get to see your own thought process and your own arguing uh, habits um, kind of played out when you have to analyze your own writing. So I think you, that might also be a, something you'd uh, get some benefit from. So that's the first step of the, um, of the assignment is to compose the essay that then um, you will be analyzing. And then the rest of the assignment is actually going to proceed exactly like what you'll have to do on the, the final section of the exam when you have to do this extended argument of analysis. Um, the next step will be to take the essay that you have um, written and you will put the annotations in there. So um, I'll want you to highlight portions of your text um, as if you're kind of like circling them to label them and then put the annotation in parentheses because I realized in the when I was given the, the lecture before that you're not really going to be writing these things down. So um, I, I'm actually going to have you probably do it this way on the exam too, where you'll use a word processor to um, highlight passages and um, and then put your annotations in that way. And I'll give you a demonstration of that um, uh, a little bit later in these uh, video lectures about how I want you to handle that. Um, but that, that'll be the next step is to go through your essay and um, grab and annotate all those things that we were talking about in the previous module, the building blocks of arguments. So that means argument markers for premises and conclusions, assuring, guarding, discounting, and evaluative markers, positive and negative. Um, so that'll be the next step. And again, I don't want, I, I want you to compose the essay not necessarily with an eye to what these other analytic steps that you have to do. The more natural you do it, the better. Um, the more it'll be like real life experience rather than just setting up layups. You're like, I'm going to guard here. And then you're like, oh, look at that. I guarded. Uh, you know, definitely just write it and then and then listen to it um, for the annotations later. And then the final step of the analysis will be to put the argument into standard form and diagram it. And all the stuff that's involved with that. And that is actually a lot more difficult than the previous chapter kind of made it look like. Uh, you have to do a little bit of standard form stuff in chapter three, but um, we're going to take that to the, that game to the next level and having to diagram the argument too. And that's all the stuff that you're going to learn in these uh, coming video lectures here with the material from chapter five. Um, the, the point here, and I want, if I wanted to put it 
kind of big picture here what we're trying to accomplish. What we're trying to do with making a standard form, which is kind of breaking down what are the premises and the conclusions, and then making a diagram, which will be a visual depiction of how those claims support each other in chains of arguments, um, the whole point of that, put those together, and it's like we're painting a picture of the argument, and, it, and specifically the ideas in the argument, not the language. This is going to be continuing with the theme that we had in the last two modules with the um, the language of arguments and the building blocks of arguments. You know, I was constantly talking about this distinction between um, the language we use to express concepts and then the concepts themselves. So, like um, how in um, conversational implication, we have to listen for the meaning that we think the person is trying to convey, rather than just stick to what the words give us. Um, and with the annotations, you know, I was saying you have to listen for the phenomenon and then the, the sort of things that we're trying to annotate for, those things happening, and then go looking for the language that's responsible for making them happen. This time, we're not even going to bother with trying to track anything about the language at all. All we're trying to do is reconstruct the logic, the conceptual and rational logic of the argument that a person is making. That's our, that's our goal. And um, in painting that picture, I, I love this painting picture metaphor. I'm going to use this a lot because um, what's sort of going on here is that if I wanted to make a portrait of you, uh, let's say I'm a painter and I, and I make portraits, I have a lot of uh, artistic license here about how I'm going to portray you. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover every single physical detail, like every pore of your skin or hair on your head. I'm not going to do that. But I want to capture kind of the major aspects of what's going on here. If I, like, uh, paint your nose completely with a different shape, I mean, that's going to make a big difference on being able to recognize who the person is, um, to have this depiction of what the person looks like. Um, and even beyond that, when we start getting into more aesthetic levels, there's, like, uh, a, great, a great portrait artist is able to not just create a picture that looks like the person that they're painting, but it's also able to kind of capture their soul, like capture their spirit of like uh, what kind of person they are, that it gives off the, that the painting gives an aesthetic impression that also in some way um, represents the uh, personality and, and soul of the, the subject being painted. So, and that's, that's also an apt part of the metaphor for what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing the most um, radical type of listening that we've done yet so far, I think. Um, especially as we get to the most difficult part of this section, which is uh, so-called enthematic arguments, which I've mentioned before in a previous lecture. Um, enthematic arguments are arguments that have hidden premises to them. That is, premises that are an important part of the logic of how the argument works but are never explicitly stated when the person was making their argument. But we can recover that, just the same way that we used conver the, uh, Paul Grice's theory of conversational implication, uh, use those principles to help guide our interpretation to figure out what a person might be implying that goes beyond what they explicitly said. Same thing will happen here with arguing. And actually, it's going to be very, very, very similar. Um, but if there's a universal maxim or... Um, bit of advice for how things are going to proceed during this section and as we like work on all the little steps and all the little ways things can go wrong and things to look out for and all these tips and techniques there's one kind of overriding pattern here that we will be using and that pattern is this this is the game and it's exactly like what happened with conversational implication first we need to um, determine or, and capture what was explicitly a part of someone's argument. And then, we'll, once we've got what's explicit and clear-cut and no, not really controversial in terms of interpretation, like the literal stuff, like when we were talking about conversational implication, once we've got that down, then we can go to the second step of starting to do things like looking for implication, finding hidden premises, like in these enthematic arguments things, making judgment calls about how to, to capture what the person is saying or what they're arguing for that kind of maybe goes beyond the words that they used and not just using a kind of copy paste method. I'm going to constantly go back to that. I'll be like, don't, you can't use the copy paste method of reconstructing arguments. You're going to have to make artistic judgment calls. I like putting it that way. You're going to have to make a judgment call 
They're going to have to be informed. It is creative, but it's not like you can do whatever you want. Okay? We are still trying to listen. We're trying to capture what someone else has said, what someone else has argued. Um, that's the game that we're playing. I want to bring up the lecture notes here. Um, and you know you have access to these lecture notes like in every other module. Um, but I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little off script a little bit more with these video lectures because you can use my lecture notes almost like a, a reference, but I, I really want to give you the kind of broad vision of what we're up to here, the like the forest level, not the tree level. I just want to keep the forest level, the strategic level in mind here um, before talking about all the little tiny things because it's really easy to get lost in them. And the details matter, and they sometimes matter a great deal, and you want to be sensitive to them. But if you have a bunch of details and you don't have a broader vision to locate them in, then they're going to be overwhelming. And this is where we get into things like when people say, like, I overthink things. You know, when it gets overwhelming because you just got all these details, you actually need to do some more critical thinking to figure out how to locate and organize them. And I think having a having the big picture vision here helps more. So I'm, my video lecture is actually going to focus more on that and focus more on a kind of hands-on approach to teaching the methods here. So let's take a look at the lecture notes. All right, so here with um, with lecture three, you see, I'm, I've really kind of gone through what the book lays out in in, um, in chapter five and kind of just collated everything and, and, and set it up. In some cases, I've given some extra advice or broken it down a little bit more. Um, but honestly, um, reconstructing, there's a lot of steps here, and it might look like an overwhelming procedure. Um, this is, again, why I want you to see the forest instead of the trees. Um, there are some steps that need to happen before others, like doing this step, which is really doing the annotation activity we talked about in the last module, does need to come before the rest of it. And figuring out what's the, what are the explicit premises and putting that into standard form first before we do all the more exciting things, that definitely needs to come first. But for the most part, this isn't a step-by-step -step list, like do one, then do the next thing. It's, it's not like a protocol in that sense. Um, more, more so, what each of these things is talking about is one particular aspect of reconstructing the argument that is um, relevant to our overall efforts. So like the different aspects of painting a portrait, like maybe getting the proportions right, or how to paint uh, the way light is on skin realistically. Um, certain things like this or how to handle hair you know like there's all these different parts to making a good portrait um, and there's all these different parts to m putting um, putting a picture together of someone's argument and have it be a good one and really there are two um, there are two core this is also this is a good big picture thing as far as vision for reconstructing arguments what we really want to aim for is clarity and accuracy those are kind of the two main things if we're painting our portraits here. What do we care about that will make for a good portrait? Clarity and accuracy. And the reason is that, you know, we don't, we're not training this technique. Like, we're not doing this as a part of the class just to, like, do this mindless exercise that you're never going to use in the real world. The whole point of breaking things down like this is actually to make it easier for us to engage with the arguments at the level of evaluating them. Now we're we're not there yet. I keep saying like we're not at we're not evaluating arguments yet. We're just learning how to listen to arguments and analyze them and see what's there. And that's and that is true. But we want to analyze them so that we can evaluate them. That that is the eventual goal. That's where we're trying to arrive at. Um, so we're we're setting ourselves up for that. Um, maybe you can uh, sympathize with this. Like. Um, Maybe you listen to a lecture or um, someone speaking or you're just in a conversation with a friend having a debate and it can get a little, it can start to get really messy. It can be like, wait, okay, so what are you saying? Like, how is this supposed to work? Why am I supposed to be convinced that you're right? What does your logic depend on? We've gone to all these different places. Like, you've made this claim, you made that claim. How are these all supposed to be related? It can get really messy and it can be really confusing to, like, navigate what's happening and what's actually been argued to figure out where to go next in the debate. That's what these techniques are for. And I actually sometimes use them. And when I'm reading a, and working on some philosophy, sometimes I, I really hash it out the way that we're going to be learning how to do it. Um, and I, I think it can be fruitful to do it. Sometimes you may not use these techniques in the real world. 
but by learning how to do them in this really explicit way, you actually are kind of training your own mind for what to listen for and how to analyze it. I, I really believe that if you, if you get a lot of good practice here and you really master this technique of reconstructing arguments in standard form and giving a diagram to them, that even if you never use that ever again, you never actually go through that procedure when you're reading some argument or having a spoken debate and you like lay it all out, um, it'll still help your efforts at being able to listen and track what's going on in a more complex argument. Because you've got some mental pictures, you've got some mental models that you'll be developing as you work on this homework and do the exams and all that good stuff in the paper project, um, that it'll kind of change the the pattern of your thinking and even if you're doing it just kind of informally in your head instead of writing it all out on a piece of paper or something like that you'll, you'll still see your in, your analytic chops strengthened so uh, I really believe that that's true and and I don't know maybe you can get back to me in a year or so after you complete the course and tell me if it worked out that way but I really think there's some practical application here even if you don't go go through all these steps but these steps are here for a reason the steps are there because the trees do matter too. So we got the forest picture, but um, there are some details here. But again, you've got a lot of artistic license, and when you're actually doing the homework problems, I don't imagine you're going to be going linearly through these steps. In fact, don't try to do that either. Try to just uh, listen to these lectures, take a look at the reading, look at the lecture notes, understand what each of these different components brings to the overall picture, and then put it together as best you can trying to be clear in your presentation of what someone is arguing and accurate to what they're actually saying. This is going to be the balancing act that we're going to be playing. Another theme that I've talked about in this class that is absolutely relevant for this unit um, is the whole game of making the implicit explicit. We want to take all the stuff that's kind of hiding there implicitly in the argument and lay it all out for everyone to see so we, it, we can also get on the same page understanding each other and then point at those now that we've got them there we can point at them and start evaluating them that's going to be the next step after we get done with this um, module when we after the first exam that's what we'll be going to next sorry for that flash that's a screen I'm gonna bring up later uh, okay so back to the lecture notes there's all these different steps here and they all kind of holistically go together uh, in, in giving you guidance and direction about how to reconstruct arguments in the best way possible. Now, another um, important thing here, I've got this important note, I'll get to this when we get to it, but after we get through step seven, this is where we're dealing with the suppressed premises, those hidden premises that I mentioned earlier. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail later. Once you get into step eight, which notice is like halfway through the lecture notes, there's a lot of extra lecture notes left yet. This is where you can effectively stop. Um, there's not going to be um, any any of this material past here is not really going to show up on the exam, um, but there's some really interesting stuff here that I, I still want you to read my lecture notes about this, and, it, and it's in the some of this stuff is in uh, chapter five too. But I want you to take a look at it because this is sort of transitioning from reconstructing the arguments and understanding and listening to what they and getting a clear and accurate picture of them to getting into um, evaluating them. So the transition from listening to evaluation, to critical evaluation. And there's some there's some good stuff here. Uh, it might be on your mind since that's kind of where we're at with the material. So please check that out. But after step seven, the rest of it won't really be on the exam. I'm not, not going to be testing that for anything. But still useful stuff. I especially like the little aside on fundamental principles. I'm probably not going to get to it in these uh, video lectures, but it, it's still pretty cool um, having to do with uh, ways in which arguments can feel intractable at times. And I, um, I kind of disagree with the book a little bit, so I throw my two cents into that discussion too. But okay, all right, let's get um, <clears throat> let's get back to the the uh, analytic activity at hand. What we're going to be doing here: arranging arguments in a standard form, and then diagramming them. Now, standard form, we've already talked about uh, at a couple occasions, actually. And let me bring this up here. This should be like the start of a standard form. Um, you're going to have the conclusion down here. This is, where, this is where a conclusion would be. And then up here is where you'd be putting the premises. And there might just be one or there could be more. Um, and you'll go up and up and up from here. 
This little triforce again means the therefore symbol. And we always put this line here um, to indicate um, that there is a, a conclusion being drawn. So the two conventions for conclusions are uh, to draw the line, put the conclusion below it, and then put this therefore symbol. We could have a bunch of other premises here. In fact, we probably will um, as I start going through an example a little bit later. And it might be that, say, claim number four um, is also oops, receiving support from five. So we might have, uh, here, let me get the shapes. There we go. We might have a situation like this. This could happen. So you've got maybe a chain of arguments. Um, four is a conclusion of this argument, but it might be a premise for defending this claim. And that's why we're not going to really mark premises and conclusions in, in standard form here. We're just going to put the claim down um, because you can have these nested chains. That kind of thing can definitely happen. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back here for a second. Okay. And I do actually recommend when you're putting your standard form problems together on the exam or in your homework, um, definitely give yourself lots of space here because um, it's uh, another big picture idea here. I'm a, I teach this method of reconstructing arguments a little different from the book. Um, and this is my main thing to talk about in this lecture today. I always think you should start with the conclusion and work your way backward. So that's gonna, I'm going to repeat that a lot, but that's the first time it's coming up. Keep that in mind. I'm going to say it over and over again. I think it's by far the biggest contribution I can make to helping you learn this material. Of all the different tips and tricks and stuff that I advise students about reconstructing arguments, um, this is this is the one that's going to save you so much pain and misery if you start with the conclusion and trace the lines of support backwards from there. Um, instead, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll talk about more the, more later. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So we'll start with the conclusion. You'll list all the premises up here. Uh, there might be these chains of arguments and sub-arguments. That might be happening. Um, but this is standard form. You're getting all of the claims that are in the argument sort of listed out here. And we're actually going to start numbering them. Because the other thing that we're going to use as a supplement to standard form is a diagram. And here's an example of a couple diagrams. These are very simple ones. Uh, we're going to talk about more complicated ones. But these diagrams are actually going to be drawn out like this, um, and I will have you draw them. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about how you'll be able to do that. But um, they're showing lines of support. The arrows are showing, like, like claim two is giving support to claim one. Claim three is giving independent support for claim one. Over here, you've got claims two and three making an argument to support one. Um, these sorts of support relations and the structure of them, especially as things get more complicated, like if you've got sub-arguments going on, you know, like this, if there's the lines of support keep going backwards here, standard form's not going to show you all that structure. So the standard form coupled with the diagram will give us a kind of complete picture of, um, of the argument that's being offered. That's your portrait that you're painting. It's actually those two things together, standard form plus diagram. What are the claims that are in the argument? And what's the structure that those of support that those claims are arranged in? There's a lot of complex patterns that can happen there. All right, so we've done a lot of big picture stage setting here, and it's really worth it. Um, all those things that I've been mentioning in this video lecture so far are really important pieces to the puzzle. Um, and but I will I'll be mentioning them over and over again through these video lectures. So I I don't think you have to like go through and memorize everything that I said here. Um, Although you do have the video, so you can always go back and listen to it again. But um, I'll, I'll be bringing these things up, especially as we work through a case example, um, which I will actually be a familiar one here. I'm going to be, after we sort of talk through some stuff in the lecture, I will have a, another video where I will go through this argument here um, from the Chapter 4 homework, from the 3-4 homework. There was this exercise where you had to do these annotations. Um, this is a little bit long and actually a fairly more complicated argument than what you might see on the exam. Uh, there's one, you know, there's, there, there's going to be some, the, I'll talk more about the exam problems when we get closer, but this is definitely a lot more words than I'm going to give you. I'll probably give you something maybe more like, like this. There's one that's sort of like this, and there's another one that's maybe like that size. Um, so maybe not something quite this long. But um, you take a, a passage of argumentative prose like this, or like you're going to do on your paper assignment, um, 
and we'll reconstruct this argument that's being offered in standard form and diagram. And I'll walk you through that together so you can see it happening in, in practice too, uh, and not just all these abstract concepts. And I'll, I'll talk through the reasoning that I'm using, kind of like um, an artist who's explaining um, how, why they're making the decisions that they're making uh, artistically uh, in, in doing whatever they're doing. I, I really like this artistic metaphor here because critical reasoning is really creative. It's not just this um, like mathematical calculation kind of analytic activity. It, it's, it's really something um, a little more um, robust and creative than that. Okay, so lots of judgment calls. Let's see, I, I always mention judgment calls. You gotta make a lot of them in critical reasoning, um, but you want them to be as informed and careful and, and intentional as possible. And the goals here are, again, are clarity and accuracy. All right, but let's talk about the order of procedure here. Um, that isn't is going to be a little more linear. So let's, before we get into the the looser stuff. Um, let's talk about what you do definitely want to do in order. The first thing is to do these annotations. In my last lecture on the in the last module, a, a, a bunch of the lectures in that module, I mentioned how we are going to be using those annotations for this module. When we're doing this uh, more difficult analytic project of reconstructing arguments, those annotations are going to be kind of like the landmarks that, that we tie together to reconstruct the full picture of the argument, like a full map of the, of the territory. Um, and they're going to be so useful to us. Um, the first one that's going to be very useful is um, annotating for the argument markers for uh, premise indicators and conclusion indicators, because um, that's going to help us with this step, figuring out what are the explicit premises and the conclusion. Um, you remember when I was talking about um, argument markers, I was talking about how sometimes we argue like this, blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. If I use therefore, it makes it completely explicit that one, I'm arguing, and what claims are getting support and which claims are giving support. What's the premise and what's the conclusion? Very explicit. That's so helpful. You'll use those argument markers to get started on your standard form, and then we're going to make some judgment calls from there. But again, like I said, I'm going to repeat all these things over and over again. We're going to start what's explicit and then move to what's implicit. So don't get crafty yet. Be dumb first. Just take things flat first. And then when there's fuzzy areas, when there's wiggle room, then you'll use your ingenuity to make the best judgment call. But don't start with making judgment calls if you don't have to. Don't turn it into a difficult interpretive game until the point that it's actually called for. Just like with Paul Grice's Maxims of Conversational Implication. You don't start with conversational implication. You wait until there's something weird, and then you use implication to solve that problem. Very similar thing's going to happen with reconstructing arguments. OK. So um, argument markers are very important. They tell us what's explicit. Other times, though, we argue like this, blah, 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 blah. Argument happened, but I didn't use any argument markers. We're going to cover that. It'll happen later. <laughs> the first thing that we're going to do is start with what's explicit, and then will recognize that not everything that's happening with arguing or any language is going to be explicit. We'll make room for the rest of it, for implication and stuff of that nature. But in our procedure, we definitely want to start with what's explicit first. So we're going to identify the argument markers and compose a list of explicit assumptions and the conclusion. And you'd start that in there. So um, again, with teaching my method, you know what, we're just going to, I'm not going to save this for later. Let's just do this as we do it. So if I gave you this passage to reconstruct into an argument, the first thing we have to do is listen for the conclusion. And argument markers will help us. Um, da, 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 da. Where are some argument markers? Da, 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 da. Ooh, there's not a lot of them in here. Da, da, da. So there's an argument marker. So I know that there's something, there is an explicit connection here. So this is a conclusion for whatever is the rest of this is coming before somewhere. We'll have to make a judgment call about that as the premises. This so is indicating that they're drawing a conclusion at this point. Okay. Um, for is also doing that same thing. This is also an argument marker. Um, this is providing a premise um, that is going to defend what came before as a conclusion. Um, and that's, that's what we get. So 
In this particular passage, we don't get a lot of argument markers. So that's going to make our job a little harder. We don't have as much to work explicitly off of. Um, but this is where I was saying like things are going to be kind of amorphous. It's not just going to be do this step, then do this step, and do this step. Um, when If we're using my method, which is to figure out the conclusion and work your way backward, um, we are going to still try to stick with what's explicit first and then move to what's implicit. Um, but in this case, we're not given a lot to work with explicitly in terms of figuring out what, what is a conclusion. For one thing, if we use these argument markers, so and for, and looked at the conclusions that they specifically offer, like have a cup of equal exchange coffee and make a small farmer happy, well, that's maybe getting close to it, but um, that, are, that your decision need not be completely altruistic is definitely not the main point of this whole thing. Think about the ultimate conclusion the starting point at the bottom of your standard form, claim number one, has got to be something that is the main point of the whole argument. It may not be the topic sentence of the article. Uh, you got to be careful about that. Topic sentence isn't always the conclusion. And conclusions don't always come first or last in a passage of argumentative prose. They can show up wherever. So we got to be careful. We kind of have to look at the whole thing and ask ourselves, what's the bottom line? What are they trying to, what's the ultimate conclusion they're trying to convince us of? Um, and make that judgment call listening as carefully as we possibly can. Okay? So that's what we're going to do here. Um, and looking at everything that they're talking about, like this is actually getting close. Have a cup of equal exchange coffee. Make a small farmer happy. Um, but if we want to, we, again, we're going for accuracy and clarity here. We want to try to capture what's the concept, what's the idea that the speaker is trying to get across. And I think in this case, looking at everything that they talk about and all the different points that are brought up and where are they kind of all pointing, right? Where's the, what's the conclusion that everything is ultimately about defending? I think it's going to be something like um, you ought to buy equal exchange coffee. Something like that. Again, you can reword claims. This is uh, this is something I talk about a little bit further down here in the lecture. Clar the step about clarifying premises and conclusions. Um, you can. This means you have the ability. You're able to make the decision to reword the claim when you put it into standard form. If that's going to help with clarity and accuracy in understanding the argument, you don't have to use the language that the speaker used. And oftentimes we speak in unclear ways. So it might be really helpful to rephrase it. You don't have to rephrase it either unless that would be crucial for clarity and accuracy purposes. But it's definitely um, it's a tool in your toolbox. It's a paintbrush that you can paint with. Um, you can use your own um, artistic judgment here in deciding how you want to, to word the claims that are showing up in standard form. Generally I say be willing to do it. In particular one of the biggest things to avoid is pronouns. If claims have pronouns in them, in like the passage that you're originally analyzing here, then you don't want those pronouns to show up in standard form. We want each one of the claims here in standard form to be able to make sense all by itself. Taken in isolation, we want to be able to understand what's the idea of that claim. Pronouns refer to things that are happening in other sentences and other claims, so that would be confusing. So watch for the pronouns. But if there's a, if there's a general message here, it, it let, at this first step, these early steps here of um, putting the explicit premises and the conclusion in standard form and maybe doing some clarification along the way here, um, it's this. When you're analyzing something let's, like, like this paragraph here, don't start from the beginning of the essay, go line by line, left to right, top to bottom, and then copy and paste all the claims that are being made and sort of collecting them in a bucket as you go and then when you're all done kind of dumping all them all out on the table and then trying to figure out what order they're supposed to go in. Um, I think in some ways the book might suggest this or this is what I often hear students coming away from. I've taught this textbook for a while and when I first started using it that's what students always did with it and I was like this is this doesn't make any sense this is not a good technique um, you're going to drive yourself up the wall being like, well, where does this claim go, that claim? You're kind of having to remake the argument for the person, like kind of reverse engineering it. And you can just listen to what they're doing, and it goes so much better. You can use your intuition here. You can use um, 
your informal judgment calls to help with this. And it, I think the procedure that I teach is way, way, way better than this copy-paste linear method. Starting with the conclusion and then trying to trace the lines of support backwards. And looking at the, uh, the passage that you're analyzing in a very holistic way here. So once you kind of looking at it as a whole, figure out what's the ultimate conclusion, then you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna step back and ask, okay, how are they defending that? So you know, if we got our conclusion down here, uh, let's say these are just examples, so let, let me, as if I was doing this on an actual problem, I would be sort of building the standard form and the diagram simultaneously. So I've got the conclusion claim, boom, done. Conclusion established. Next question. What is being used to defend it? Where is the support for this claim coming from? Right. What is being said to support this claim? That's the next thing that you want to be listening for and making a judgment call about. Uh, okay, so don't go through the essay just collecting a bunch of claims in a bucket and dumping them all out. We can be smarter about this. We know that the argument is going to have one ultimate conclusion. Um, sometimes people are making multiple arguments, but then they're just they're just different arguments. Um, each conclusion is a separate argument that we'd be analyzing for. But we want to focus one argument at a time. What's the ultimate point? What are the claims that they're using to support that? And then when we figure out those things, we'll ask, did they give any support for those claims? So then we get to these levels of sub-argumentation. I think following, tracing the lines of support backwards is the most intuitive easy, accessible way to approach doing these assignments. Um, and I highly, highly recommend that you do them that way rather than doing it in this copy-paste linear way. Also, the problem with the copy-paste method is if you don't exercise your creative license to uh, reword things or to um, uh, you know, make these little extra adjustments that are not just there in the essay, you're not going to get a clear or accurate picture of what the argument is really being given. So sometimes you have to express that creative license. And so you want to be looking for it right from the get-go. Um, again, trying to reconstruct the argument um, uh, as clearly and accurately as possible. Now, just like if I'm painting a portrait, there's some pretty big things that I need to get right first. Before I start figuring out, like, what exactly is the shape of the eyebrows, you know, I need to figure out something like, do they have eyebrows? Or, like, maybe what's the shape of the face, you know, or... Um, some, some of the major features, like the relative placement of eyes, mouth, nose, ears, that kind of thing. Um, we got some big things to handle first, and there's nothing bigger than the conclusion. If you get the conclusion wrong for what, what someone's, if you're trying to paint this picture of what someone's arguing, you get the conclusion wrong, that's huge. There's no bigger mistake that you could make than a mistake there. If you misinterpret a claim that's like a few sub-arguments down, not as big of a deal in terms of having a clear picture of what's happening um, because the conclusion matters so much. We talked about this with guarding. Remember I was saying that if the conclusion is guarded, that's going to drastically change whether the claims that are being made as the evidence for that conclusion are going to be adequate to support it or not. Um, the, the conclusion really is like the, um, the lighthouse that sends out this beacon that gives you direction no matter where you are in the argument. Um, a lot of the other techniques I'm going to teach you in these videos depend on citing or recalling, getting back to remembering what is the conclusion of the argument and using that as your guide. So this is the most crucial thing to get right in painting a clear and accurate picture of an argument is what is the conclusion. And it's going to guide reconstructing the rest of it. But I kind of as you move back in the support here, so you know, starting with the conclusion and then maybe, oh, this is a premise, this claim supports this claim, as we keep going back, it becomes less and less important. In fact, going back to the paper project, um, when I'm asking you to reconstruct your argument in standard form and diagram it, in a 500-word essay, depending on how you write, some people write more densely, some people write with more fluff. But if you write pretty densely, if you get a lot of arguments in there, you really pack all the arguments you can in 500 words, you're going to probably have way more claims than you want to handle. I've had students uh, turn in, I mean, and there's other reasons about why this is wrong, and I'll, I'll talk about these later, actually, when we get a few steps, uh, maybe a couple of lectures from now. Um, but I've had students turn in, like, a uh, standard form for their, for their paper argument that had, like, 70 premises. And I'm like, whoa, 
that's maybe too much. Remember, when we're trying to put arguments in standard form and diagram them, we're trying to get a picture of the argument that makes it easier to understand what's happening and to evaluate it eventually. Not something that makes it even harder to follow what's happening. So um, we want to get the main things first and then start getting into the more secondary details. That's always the pattern. So on the paper, I'll tell you, if you're using my method, starting with the conclusion, getting to the arguments in support of it, and then maybe another row of sub-arguments, if you're at like 20 premises, you can probably stop, and that's good. And that you don't have to diagram every single claim that's going to be in your essay, because that's too much work. But I, li I like doing it with a 500-word essay, because it's going to be kind of training you a little bit harder than what's going to be on the exam, and requiring you to make those judgment calls to kind of bring the big picture into focus when it's so easy to get distracted with all the details. That's such an important skill for critical reasoning, to be able to see what are the major moving parts of the argument and not get distracted by all the details. Um, but also be sensitive to details and be able to know where to fit them in, when they're important, and when they're crucial. That's a weird balancing act. It might be really frustrating to hear me say that that's my advice. It sounds like you're just saying to do everything. Um, and to a certain extent I am, but there, there are judgment calls about this, and different cases are different. In some cases the details really matter, in some cases they don't. So um, the guidelines here kind of help with keeping track of all that. That's And the advice I'm going to give in all these lectures, I think, will help you meet that challenge, help you to, to, have, to play that balancing act between getting the full vision of an argument into focus and also being able to put the details where they belong, but not getting sidetracked by those details. Okay, so that's going to be a really important theme moving forward. Um, okay, so the, the, that's... Um, I'm kind of running out of time on this video lecture. Um, I'm a little hesitant to start diving into some more detail later, but um, I think there's something, there's some other basics here that we could probably get into before going to the next bit. Um, at least here on the on my lecture notes so far, we've talked about the like importance of annotations, although that'll keep unfurling as we go forward. Each of the things that we're annotating for will have its own time in the sun here. Uh, just you wait. <laughs> They'll all show up eventually. The first thing is to try to figure out the explicit claims that are going on in the argument, and that requires some listening, and to um, and to clarify, rephrase things um, when you think they're needed. Um, there's some other cleanup things that are going on here um, that I'll talk about next time, and I've already been sort of talking about step five. This is about putting the diagrams together, um, arranging the argument uh, in in this kind of uh, arrow pattern thing. And that's what maybe I can talk about a little bit more. Again, um, if you're following my advice, you're going to do the standard form and the diagram together. You're not going to do the standard form first and then figure out how to draw your diagram. That, that'll be a painful method. All this advice, trust me, it comes from experience, not just my experience, but a lot of scores and scores of students who have had experience working through this work with me and <laughs> learning it from me um, and watching them do it. Um, there's a lot of painful ways to approach these assignments. If you're working on the assignments and they are feeling very, very painful, please talk to me and maybe we can diagnose what's going on. Because um, like I'm always a fan of saying, logicians are lazy. We want to be lazy. We want to get the most bang for our buck. We don't want to just end endlessly pour over tedious details when there's a better way to do it. Um, and there are some more efficient and streamlined and intuitive ways of doing the kind of analytic tasks that we're up to uh, in this unit. So, so if you're feeling like it's like so painful, you're spending so much time on these details, getting hung up on it, or you feel like you're overthinking things, talk to me. Let's get some one-on-one -on -one time. Let me give you some more personalized advice. Um, once I know a little bit more about what's happening in your situation, watch you do something or talk me through a homework problem you're doing, um, I can usually give much more pointed and useful advice um, beyond the kind of uh, general stuff that I um, offer in these lecture notes. Okay, But there's one more thing I want to try to get out before I'm done with this video lecture. Let's go back. Let's talk. I, I've said everything there is to say about these um, standard form conventions. The only rule is that conclusions have to come below the claims that are giving them support, their premises. That's the only rule, which doesn't show us a lot of the structure of an argument. That's why we need the diagram. Diagram is going to show all this. But I wanted to um, indicate to you all the conventions that can happen here. Um, and we've got a couple of them. Um, so the first, the most important convention 
in drawing these diagrams is the arrow. The arrow means that there's an argument. There's a support relation. This is a, you know, this is a support relation. Every arrow says that there's a different support relation happening. So if I'm looking at this argument here that I've, I've diagrammed, what this is saying, it's painting this picture where it says, claim one, that's the conclusion. That's the claim that's receiving support. The arrows are pointing at it. It's saying that claim two gives me a reason to believe claim one is true. Um, it's like maybe some evidence or maybe some principle or, or something like that. Um, it's a single claim, and all by itself, it gives me a reason um, to believe one is true. Like, I mean, you know, just a quick example here from this coffee thing. What's one thing they talk about in this essay as a reason to buy equal exchange coffee? Well, it says it tastes good, right? That's kind of what they're, that's the idea that they're going for here when they're saying that your decision to buy equal exchange need not be altruistic. There's a selfish reason. We try to make the taste, it, we try to make it taste good. So if I was putting this argument together, I'd say, well, hey, one of the reasons why you ought to buy equal exchange coffee is that equal exchange coffee tastes good. That's a simple claim. Boom. Notice I'm rephrasing. I'm not using the language that they used here. Um, but this is sort of getting the idea across a little uh, more directly and clearly. Um, so that's part of the argument. We're, we're, again, capturing a part of the picture of how this argument is proceeding. They're saying they're trying to convince you of this conclusion that you ought to buy equal exchange copy. What's a the reason they give for that? It tastes good. Boom. So this would be kind of the proper way to diagram that. Claim one is true because two. Actually, you know what? That's what I was working on over here. This was the the diagram I was making for for that equal exchange coffee argument. So let's, you know, we can fill in that question mark. We know at least part of the argument, one component of it, is that the fact that equal exchange coffee tastes good is a reason why you should believe that you ought to buy equal exchange coffee. Cool, awesome, done. If we have an arrow like this, that's separate from this arrow, that means there's another reason that's being provided to believe the conclusion is true, but it has nothing to do with this first argument. This is an independent argument. There's a separate arrow. It has nothing to do with the first one. You'll notice, uh, and this will take more detail. We'll do, I'll leave this for the next lecture, but there's a lot of other reasons that are being brought up here, some maybe more complex reasons than just that it tastes good for why you should buy equal exchange coffee. Um, those are going to be independent arguments. They don't depend on it tasting good. They're about the farmers and that are poor and helping them out and how large corporations don't need money and blah, blah, blah. We'll get into all that in the next lecture. Um, but this, if we're diagramming it like this, we're saying this is a reason to believe this all by itself, and this is being offered as a reason to believe this all by itself. But sometimes arguments don't work that way. In fact, an argument I gave you in the final lecture of the last module was talking about an argument, remember the one with the conditional, you know, if this, then that, that thing is true, then this other thing is true. Th oh, that was with the validity lecture that I gave. I think maybe that was lecture two, part two. The, that argument was valid, but only if both premises are true. So that'd be more of a situation like this one right here. This situation over here, where you've got two claims together. This is a plus sign. So two plus three gives me a reason to believe that one is true. By putting the plus sign here, it's saying, look, either of these claims on its own, not good enough. If they can't, this two on its own, not enough to believe that one is true. But coupled with three, now that they together, if both of those things are true, then that gives me a good reason to think that this is true. And oftentimes, one of the most difficult judgment calls you have to make in diagramming arguments is figuring out when they've got a bunch of claims for the conclusion, are these independent arguments or are they hanging together? Now here's the crucial thing, um, a, a very common mistake that gets made by students when they're doing diagrams is they think as long as these reasons are kind of similar in theme or they're all being offered maybe at the same time, like maybe even a list, even in one sentence, they're like, and this, and this, and also because of this, that they put them together with a plus sign. But you have to think about this conceptually. You have to make a judgment call. What, Which picture of what argument the person is making makes the most sense with what they're saying. And this is where we get into some fuzzy territory and where you're going to have to make judgment calls and things get a little not so explicit. And you have to kind of maybe work on what's implicit here. Sometimes the speaker makes it clear. They're like, for one thing, this. But even if that didn't convince you, this reason should convince you. Using that kind of language makes it very explicit that we're talking about two separate arguments 
not one with a bunch of premises working together. Okay? So, but sometimes we don't use that kind of explicit language, and so you got to suss it out for yourself. You got to listen to what's going on and take your best crack at capturing the picture. But here's a good rule of thumb. If a claim all by itself could provide a reason for the conclusion, then it's probably better to separate it as much as possible. Because evaluating that claim might have nothing to do with evaluating another argument. You wouldn't want to make one argument vulnerable to objection on sort of guilt by association with another argument just because they happen to be defending the same conclusion. You could defend, you could give two different reasons for the same conclusion. One of them could be a really awesome argument and the other one could be totally crap. Um, and that kind of separation is the biggest thing to be listening for in deciding which is the right way to diagram it. Let's say, for instance, two is uh, a claim that is objectionable, you know, we can show that claim two is false. Well, that's going to destroy this argument, but maybe there still is left over a good reason to think that one is true on the basis of three, if it works like this. But if it works like this, and claim two is false, that just defeated this whole argument. It doesn't matter if three is true, because you need two and three together to get an argument to support one. So that's some of the stakes that are involved here for how you decide how to handle putting uh, putting these diagrams together, how to arrange these arguments, okay? Also, it can be confusing when the argument's got lots of claims, whether, you know, if we had to claim four up here, is claim four supporting two, or is it supporting one? You know, maybe it's a direct reason for the conclusion, or maybe it's providing support ultimately for one by giving you a reason to think that two is true. So, you know, when is it a sub-argument and when is it not? But I think if you follow my method of tracing the lines of support back, and we're still going to keep doing that here, uh, you know, we're going to be looking for more arguments for why to buy equal exchange coffee and, you know, whether it tastes good or not. Um, we're going to be tracing these lines of support backwards, and, and we'll eventually, I think you'll find sort of organically um, the whole uh, argument sort of takes care of itself in many ways. That's the hope at least. That's the um, strategy behind my method. So um, hopefully this makes sense. Um, hopefully I've answered everything about um, questions about diagrams. I'll try to um, anticipate what some of you, I'll, I'll spend some time reflecting before I make the next uh, exam. This is, this is one of those moments where doing it together in class really helps, where I'm like explaining it and demonstrating it and students can ask questions at the same time. So you know, as soon as you get questions with this, let me know and I'll try to explain it. Um, if there's a ton of questions on this, I mean, this might be one of those modules where after the fact I might end up recording a supplemental lecture to try to answer some of your questions. But another reason to come to the study sessions and, and you know, ask me questions or get a hold of me somehow, email, text, call me. I always say every lecture, right? I say do these things. Please do it. This is one of the things that I think it might very much help you. So um, I think that's everything. Let me just think for a second. Oh yeah, one very, very important thing um, that I forgot. Um, so uh, part of the um, conventions of using this diagram language with the arrows and everything is that every arrow needs to terminate in a number. What you cannot do is something like this. This diagram, let's say you got claim four, supports the plus sign. I don't know what that means. That doesn't make any sense at all. Claim four might be a reason to believe two is true, or it might be providing a reason to think three is true, um, but this can never happen. You can't have an arrow to a support, so never do that. Never, ever, never, never, no, no. Um, that's, that's, not, that's no good. Another thing that might just be a fun note here in terms of strategies with putting together diagrams, um, something I've seen a lot from students in the past, is that they kind of think that arguments work like this. You know, you got a conclusion, supporting reason, supporting reason, supporting reason. Like, this is a huge chain of reasoning going on. Um, actually, I frequently see this when students are using the left, right, top to down, copy, paste method that I'm like, don't use. Okay, usually it's that that kind of, I get this kind of answer. But this is the way, this is the way that Sherlock Holmes reasons, not the way that we reason. Most of the time, we don't have this kind of elaborate thought process of like, well, this is true because that's true, because this is true, because that, because this, the whole thing, and that's why the conclusion is true. No, we don't do that. That's not how it works. Most of the time, most of the arguments I see on the street look like this. Here's a conclusion claim. I got one reason. Hey, I got another reason. And some more reasons. And hey, if that didn't convince you, here's another reason. There's another reason. More reasons. 
it's way more frequent that you're going to see more reasons for the conclusion that are all independent reasons rather than this like elaborate chain of sub-arguments going back. That very rarely happens. Very rarely. Where it's just like this to this to this. Um, and the big thing here I think is that might be going on when students sort of interpret incorrectly that way is that they're seeing um, the flow of someone's thoughts in an essay. The like associative connections, like transition sentences. Transition sentences do not usually matter when it comes to diagramming arguments. They're like they don't have a rational function. Um, they just have a rhetorical function that helps the sort of helps the reader's thoughts move in an, in a seamless way from one thing to another. You're not making any big jumps here. You're kind of this territory moving into this territory. It's all very smooth, a gentle ride through the essay and its thought patterns and stuff like that. But we're doing something different. We're not diagramming the essay. We're diagramming the argument, the chains of support. Respect the arrow. That's a big tip here. That's what could be one of my slogans for this section with diagrams. Respect the arrow. Each arrow is saying this is providing a reason why this is true. Or these things are providing a reason why this is true. You could add more on here. You know, you could be could be three premises that make up this argument that give you a reason for one. And it takes all three for it to work. Maybe something like that is true. But respect the arrow. Each of these arrows is actually an argument. Um, so that, that's important. Okay. I think I've covered everything I want to cover in this first installment of the video lecture. Hopefully this kind of sets the stage for everything that we're going to do from here on out. Um, and we can, we've got a kind of a scaffolding that we can start hanging these other little details on as we go. Um, but uh, it's going to get fuzzy. Um, this is fuzzy logic. Informal logic is fuzzy logic. But fuzzy logic is not unprincipled logic. There, even if you're making judgment calls, there really are um, principles behind why those judgment calls might make more or less sense. And your answers in the homework, and especially when I'm grading them on the exam, this is going to be like more and less ideal. And there's ways to increase um, how good of a, a portrait artist you are. There's, you, can, you can definitely increase your skill with this a lot. So I encourage you to put a lot of effort into this, a lot of sincere effort when you're working on the homework problems. Seek me out. Get some help. Get some feedback from me. Um, these paper projects, I think, are really going to serve you well. Get started on them now. Um, even before you've listened to the rest of the lectures, um, depending on your schedule here, you can you can start doing the first part of it. You can start um, composing the essay. Uh, you can do that, and you can do the annotations at this point. You've learned all the material you need for that. You just have to get through the rest of this unit um, before you're able to uh, do the final steps of putting your argument into standard form and diagramming. But you can you can get rolling on that and and uh, take that project seriously. I think it'll it'll help you a lot to do that. Uh, the way for the exam, like the homework problems that are in the exercises are a little too easy. There are a little like layups. Um, and the paper project is like way harder and the exam is going to be somewhere in between. It's not going to be as hard as the paper project, but it's definitely going to be harder, definitely going to be harder than a lot of the uh, homework exercises. So that's why I assigned this paper assignment is to kind of stretch you to like you can get your feet under you, you can do these simple arguments and then tackle something a little bit tougher. So um, that's the logic behind that. But I think that's everything for this time. Lots more to talk about, but we'll do that in the next installment. So see you there.